In 2014, I had been in Los Angeles for four years. I had graduated from San Francisco State University with a degree in theater. <laughs> Go Gators. <laughs> And immediately afterward, I moved south. L.A. and I were not a soul match. While I received the bulk of my comedy training there at Second City in Hollywood, I couldn't seem to find much theater, and at the time, I had very little interest in doing screen work. Oddly enough, I hadn't even moved down there primarily for acting. I'd relocated for a boy. <laughs> we're married now and back in the Bay, so it all worked out. <laughs> But that's a story for another time. Ask me at the bar, seriously, I love to tell it. <laughs> but if I'm being totally honest, I never gave Los Angeles the old college try. Outside of my sketch and improv work, I hadn't found anything I really connected with, and I felt myself fading into the background of young women who all looked a lot like me, but they were all just a little closer than I was to the Los Angeles ideal. And trying to fit into that model was exhausting and brutal. Attending an audition with, with uh, five of me did not lead to the close friendship bonds or multiplicity style shenanigans you might expect. <laughs> and yes, I attended a Disney princess audition. <laughs> if you're curious, this is how it went. After being organized into a number of lines, we were asked to stand and smile and to hold the smile while they walked back and forth down the line like a drill sergeant, except instead of screaming into our faces, they smiled into our faces, which I guess was supposed to elicit a natural smile in response, but instead ended up being even more unnerving <laughs> than any drill sergeant could possibly have been. After this first and single round, I was thanked and sent home. Apparently, I couldn't even stand and smile right, which is what I thought to myself over and over again as I cried in the car all the way home. Two out of 10 would not recommend. <laughs> So I half-assed my way through Southern California, and after year four, I'd had enough. I didn't care if people raised their eyebrows at me when I said, I'm moving to San Francisco to be an actor. It was time to come home. I was lucky that I managed to maintain some of my college connections, but a lot had changed. Many of my close SF State friends had moved to New York or to Los Angeles, which was the very city I just escaped from. So the first full-length play I landed was with a theater company I'd never heard of before called Faultline performing in a venue I'd never been in before called Piano Fight. The first show I did at Piano Fight would lead me to many firsts. It was the first time in my adult life I'd play a titular role, Maggie, in Maggie's Riff, which was a memory play based on a lesser known work by Jack Kerouac. It was the first dramatic piece I was in since I'd started my focus on comedy with a tiny cast and I was desperate to do a good job. So I was shocked and pleased when it turned out it would be the first show I'd done that earned a recommended production distinction from Theater Bay Area, a San Francisco Arts Coalition. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Strategic water for applause. <laughs> Closing that show was always gonna be a little bit emotional, but if I could have seen the future, it would have comforted me to know that Piano Fight would become the place of so many more firsts. It was the first time in my life I'd have a dependably fun place to go for New Year's Eve. <laughs> it was the first time a bartender knew my drink. It was the first time I cried with a group of strangers during a certain election. An election we all were convinced would go a different way. So instead of the celebration that we all expected, we stood in a packed bar of people, silent, all feeling the same tight edge of fear and sorrow. It was the first time my art was ever hung on the wall. Now, wait a minute. So during one party, they had covered the support pillars with butcher paper for people to sign their names or write a message. I drew a doodle and signed my name. 
After a long absence from Piano Fight during pandemic, I returned to see it taped inside the stairwell leading to the dressing rooms. And it felt like the entire venue was embracing me. And I was so happy to be back, I cried. It was the first venue where I performed a Killing My Lobster show. I had joined the sketch group Killing My Lobster, or KML, as a writer and actor not long after I moved back to San Francisco. Soon I was teaching, and then they gave me the chance to be a head writer. And a few years ago, the artistic director, Allison Page, moved to Tennessee. I thought it was crazy for me to apply to her job, having literally never had a job in theater leadership before. But then I applied. And then I didn't try very hard in the interview process because I thought what I had what I thought was a very mature, like, take me or leave me attitude, but then it turned out to be like a defense mechanism. <laughs> And then Allison told me to pull my head out of my ass and actually try, which were not her exact words, but that's definitely the message she got, she meant to say, and that's the message I got. So then I tried, and then I got it. And then Piano Fight became the first place I produced a show as an artistic director. The first year at my job was very hard. <laughs> There was so much to navigate between AB5, which was a new payroll law, between COVID, and oh yeah, theater audiences bottomed out and it became impossible to predict anything, let alone if you've never done the fucking job before. <laughs> I felt so lucky to have my community and my colleague, Emma, who came on as executive director around the same time. But nothing cemented that more than when after performance of our final production of the season, Rob Reddy came on stage in the middle of my goddamn post-show speech, <laughs> to inform me and the audience that Emma and I had been on the job for one year, and tonight was our surprise anniversary party. <laughs> and thus, just a couple months before they announced their closure, Piano Fight became another first, the site of my first ever surprise party. There's another first too, and it seems small, but trust me when I say it's so much larger than it sounds. Piano Fight was the first place I felt comfortable sitting in a dressing room, just hanging out without any point to me being there. <laughs> like maybe I was early to a rehearsal, maybe got too loud in the bar, maybe I just wanted a place to sit quietly before dashing to the now closed exit theater or killing my lobster headquarters. But the point was, I could just exist in those moldy smelling dressing rooms. <laughs> Sorry, but you know it's true. <laughs> Perhaps other performers will know what I'm talking about when I say that I tend to be very aware of my existence in a creative space. How loud I'm being, how intrusive, or how I comport myself, how much I'm contributing, whether it's too little or too much. Being in a rehearsal space or a dressing room with all of its joy can be a fraught experience, but at Piano Fight, it was the first place where I could just be without wasting anyone's time. I guess you could say Piano Fight gave me permission. Piano Fight's artistic permission has already been discussed in people's stories and in articles. We we're around to, allowed to fuck around and find out, as they say, but but for me, and for many others, I expect, the permission extended beyond just the artistic work that occurred within these walls. I had permission to be simple or be messy. <laughs> I had permission to leave my credit card at the bar overnight <laughs> and be welcomed back the next day with a smile and zero judgment. I had permission to hold space for myself and for other people and to feel powerful while I did it, which is something that doesn't come easy to lots of artists, and being a female artist, it can be even more elusive. And especially after living in Los Angeles my first four years post-college, when I didn't feel like I had permission to grow in any direction except one. Piano Fight felt exceptional in that it gave me that freedom 
and it's where I learned how to grant that permission to myself. There's still a lot that we don't know about what will happen after Piano Fight closes, but that, the ability to give myself permission, that's the gift I'll be taking with me when I walk out those doors for the last time. Thank you. Give it up for Nicole O'Dell, everybody.